body, we are on the track of high performance computing and artificial intelligence. Four articles are in our first track. Every participant comes with 15 minutes and five minutes more for questions. Audience, please, all the questions should be written on the chat. Our first work is why in prediction using deep learning and high performance computing is presented by Jaume Manero, Javier Bejar, and Ulises Cortez from University Politecnica de Catalunya. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sharing my presentation. Uh, do you see it correctly? Okay. So I'm going to present, I'm affiliated with the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. And uh, I'm going to describe a work that I've made together with Javier Bejar and Dr. Ulises, Dr. Javier Bejar and Dr. Ulises Cortez. Okay. The, it's the application of convolutional networks applied to wind energy. Dr. Jaume, uh, could you please share the presentation? Okay. So, this presentation is about the application of deep learning techniques on uh, wind for wind energy generation. So, uh, first of all, good afternoon, good morning, whatever. I'm here in Spain, we are in the afternoon. Uh, I have a PhD in artificial intelligence by the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona, but I am affiliated as well to a Canadian university, to Dalhousie University, where I do some research as well. Uh, I have a long experience in energy and renewables, and this is the reason that motivated me to research in, in this area. I'm in the, my research interests are in the intersection of the energy transformation process that we are undergoing now and the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, what's the motivation for this work? The motivation for this work is that wind is very complex to predict. And wind energy is intermittent because today we don't have wind and tomorrow we don't have wind. And when we are using wind to generate electricity, it's very important to know how much electricity are we going to generate tomorrow? How much energy are we going to, gener to generate tonight in the next hour, in the next couple of days? Why? Because if there is no wind, we need other sources to cope for the, all the energy that the market, that the users are going to demand. So for countries with a high penetration of wind energy, prediction and forecasting is very important. You should think that in Spain at this moment now, we have days where we have more than 60% of our energy coming from wind. That's very special, but in average, we are around 30% of the electricity that we generate coming from, from wind. So the, the problem is, uh, can we predict wind? How do we predict wind today? We predict wind using meteorological uh, models that uh, rely on very complex equations and, and modeling, etc. But these predictions, especially for wind, are not 100% accurate. Why? Because wind is very local. Wind is a local thing. It depends on very uh, things about uh, the terrain, where it is located, etc. So sometimes the, the, the general forecast is not very good for a specific wind site. So the idea is, can we help in the prediction problem using uh, meteorological dimensions? Can deep learning be used for doing this prediction? And then the last one, which came at the end of our research is, are convolutional networks good for doing this kind of prediction? Okay. So the idea is to train the deep learning processes into a, a machine that is able to see what's going to happen in a few hours regarding the wind for a specific site to use this prediction for integration of the electricity into the system. Then just uh, a specific thing from our research was that we are doing multi-step prediction. What's multi-step prediction? Multi-step prediction is predicting several steps, several steps into the future. Uh, if you look at the works in this area, usually they predict only one place in the future. 
So the win at 12 hours, the win at two hours, or the win at five hours. Now we are predicting the wind in the next 12 hours or uh, in, into the future. So we, this is the reason that we're calling this a multi-step prediction. So when we started this work as in any other deep learning project, you need the data. Data is extremely relevant for applying deep learning because we need massive amounts of data for being uh, for applying our algorithms, so we started a very uh, uh, an intensive research trying to find the best data set for this. Uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of data sets of wind available. Why? Because the the wind producers don't like to share their data. So at the end, we found the National Renewable Laboratory in the U.S who has a very interesting data set and a very massive data set of 126, 692 uh, sites. So we have, you can see in the screen, a map of the US and all with uh, a representation of all the sites, where are they placed? So it's very good because we have sites everywhere in the US geography. So we can have different wind patterns in, in, in the geography. You can see in this figure, you can see that the most intensive wind is found just in the plains, in the, in the center of the US and in the Atlantic coast, where in the, I would say in the west, in the west area of the US are the weakest uh, winds. You can see them in dark blue. Okay, so we have wind sites of all different kinds. That, and that's important because we want to find out how our uh, algorithms um, behave across all the different wine, uh, wine uh, regimes that we have. So we did, uh, we developed an experimentation setup using this data. So what we did is uh, we created a framework. You can see in the right hand side, we design a new architecture. Then we do a hyperparameter optimization with a reduced set of sites. And then we run the experiment with the whole data set. And then we analyze the results. So the idea was to test as many architectures as possible in, in our work. So you can imagine 126,000 sites with many, many different uh, deep learning architectures, we require uh, a supercomputer. So we use the Barcelona supercomputing Minotauro uh, GPU uh, server or computer. This is a, a computer that has 250, 94 teraflops, and it's built of, uh, it's a cluster of 39 servers. And each one of the servers has two, uh, two CPUs plus two CPU cards, okay? So we had this very large computing resource and, we, uh, and all our algorithms were run into this, into this server, which is a, a small part of the computing center, but it's, uh, it's a GPU, uh, computer. So uh, we prefer for the deep learning to use a GPU computer. So we tested many different. Uh, today I'm going to focus in this in this presentation about the convolutional networks. So basically, in the we used the data uh, had seven years of data. So we used five years for training and two years for uh, prediction. Uh, one for validation and another one for testing. The, the time series of the data uh, had many different uh, meteorological variables like temperature, humidity, wind direction, wind speed, uh, et cetera. Okay, so we had seven or eight variables. So that's the reason this is a multi-variable uh, multi uh, time series. And our output, as I said, it's a 12 hour prediction of the wind. Okay, so you can see on the left, this is a multi-layer perceptron. That was uh, the, the easiest architecture. And then a convolutional architecture, we use the convolutional architecture. And then on top of it, we use a multi-layer perceptron to the, generate the, the final sequence. So this is, I would say, a summarize of the two main structures that we use, and then with lots of refinements internally. Each architecture obtains a unique result. We can see on the left a distribution of all the different 
uh, results that we have over the 126,000 sites. Uh, on blue, it's for the test, um, uh, or for the test, and on yellow or, or brown, it's for the validation. So for the sixth and the seventh year. And you can see differences between the years. So we can see that the training deteriorates as the years go along, okay? And then for each one of the experiments, we can see how the experiments, how the results, errors, are uh, distributed across the geography. We can see here an example for one of the experiments. And you can see in blue that in the places with the strongest winds, the error is larger. And for instance, in the Atlantic coast, as well with uh, strong winds, it's much uh, the, the sites, we call it in, 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 uh, in our experimentation, we call them easier. So you can see that the same method for different sites has different rates of error, which is something important. And I'm going to talk about this later. We can see as well as expected that the prediction of the hours that are further away in time it's much higher than the prediction of the first hours. So in the first hours, we have a very small error, but then as, as time goes by, the error increases. Okay, so another thing is that you can see here that the errors, there are lots of outliers in each one of the errors. So just coming back one time, there are places that are very difficult to predict and places that are very easy to predict. That was one of the conclusions of our work. So going to the results, uh, we obtained the best convolutional architecture was a two-layer convolutional architecture with separable convolution, which is uh, something that it's aligned with the ImageNet results with images, but it happened as well with, uh, our, uh, with our experimentation. Uh, you can see here some of the results. Okay, You see that the convolutional network, the vanilla convolutional network had uh, an R2 result of 7.26 and the separable have 7.32. With the hyperparameter setting, which is a very important process in our experimentation, we can fine tune and get uh, even better. The best result was obtained with this architecture using a gradient boosting uh, kind of semi -gra gradient boosting and we can get as high as almost eight in this, in this rating. Okay, so some conclusions from this work. So the first conclusion was that deep learning architectures are effective from wind prediction, better than expected, I would say. Uh, we see that they are a useful tool for practical for, for, the, for the field when we want short-term weather forecasts. And here I cite one uh, work that's been published by DeepMind uh, a couple of weeks ago in Nature. Uh, that it's talking about uh, now casting using radar images. So it's clear that deep learning can be a very good tool for predicting uh, weather at a very close, at the next couple or three hours. And then one of our findings was that the convolutional networks were quite effective for this kind of work. Uh, the separable convolution show better results consistently and you can see that our experimentation was in many different sites. Uh, another thing is that the best architecture is quite shallow. shallow. Uh, the best architectures are not very deep. What I say deep is the number of layers. And then two very important uh, findings. The lag is small. So the, the amount of time that we have from the past is not, it's very reduced, so we use to, for predicting the future, we use only 12, 13 hours of wind from the past because the wind is so chaotic, I would say, that the wind that we had two days ago is not important for predicting the wind tomorrow. What's important is the wind in the first, in the 18 hours before the prediction. And then something else is that the higher frequency series improve the results. Our series were sampled at five minutes and uh, we believe that with series sampled at one minute, we could get better results. We did the small experiments and we had very promising results. Then for future work, uh, we know we discovered that using ensembles, we, can, we show better results. And then our idea is why don't not use complex ensembles? 
like using radar images, including weather forecasts from different sources, and then especially obtaining time series with high frequency data. These time series are not available now. So we need better open source data in this field in order to advance. Uh, and at this moment, I'm, I'm involved in an initiative with a university in, in Germany that we are trying to develop a data set for this specific task, a better data set than the ones that we have available now. So these are the three publications from this, from this work. And I think I, I exhausted my 15 minutes. So you ha we have the questions now. I'm open to any questions that we have from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for your valuable contributions. If anyone wants to ask, please do on the chat. Well, I think um, later we are going to share the question because I didn't see anything, but it's very clear the contribution. So now we are start with the second work distributed. Now large scale distributed deep learning, a study of mechanisms and trade-offs with Pipe Talk, presented by Albert Rojas, Fabricio Quiroz Corella, Terry Jones, Esteban Meneses from Costa Rica Institute of Technology. Go ahead. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello, hello, my name. Hello, my name is Elvis Rojas. Uh, today, I'm going to present the paper uh, "Large Scale Distributed um, Large Scale Distributed Deep Learning: A Study of Mechanisms and Trade-off with PyTorch." Uh, this work was carried out together with researchers of the Costa Rica Ni National High Technology Center and the Outreach National Laboratory. Um, the, the outline for this presentation is as follows. First, uh, there is an introduction to the topic, followed by the contribution of this paper. Uh, after that, uh, I will describe some background concepts. Uh, also, before analyzing the experiment results, I will talk about the, uh, the key elements of, this, the, of the methodology that we used. Uh, in the experimental results, uh, I will describe some important results related to scalability, trade-off related to accuracy and scaling. Also, floating point uh, mixed precision and adaptive summation in distributed training. Finally, uh, I will present the conclusions of this study. Uh, the recent wave of artificial intelligence um, led by deep, deep neural networks uh, has contributed in many fields, many fields in science, uh, engineering, and business. Uh, in particular, deep learning models are becoming larger to cope with increasing data complexity. Training a DL model with thousands or millions of parameters is a, a difficult computational problem. Then to other this challenge, uh, distributed uh, deep learning models training could be decomposed into, distribu uh, into a distributed approach. However, uh, there are many design decisions and trade-offs when attempting this. Uh, this paper explore, explores, explores the details uh, using an experimental approach. Uh, then this study focused uh, uh, on the training time performance and scalability analysis of, ba of various di distributed training mechanisms of PyTorch, uh, such as uh, distributed data parallel, Horwood, deep speed, and on fair scale. Uh, the contribution of this paper are the following. First, a uh, survey of the most popular PyTorch distributed training mechanisms describing the most, the most important detail uh, for their implementation. An analysis of the performance offered by the different distributed uh, training mechanisms when scaling on several GPUs. 
And another study of the effects of using different uh, CNNs with the different distributed training mechanisms. Also, a study of the trade off between CNNs learning and the GPU scaling uh, using all the distributed training mechanisms and CNNs included in this paper. And finally, a performance analysis of two advanced optimization approaches in distributed training. One uh, is related to the floating point precision and another related to the updating of weights of a CNN. As a background, uh, in the background of our study, we describe the most important elements related to this, this study. Uh, we take into account concepts of convolution neural networks and frameworks used in the deep learning application. In addition, uh, we describe the distributed training mechanisms, mechanisms implemented in Python uh, that are part of this study. Uh, also among the distributed training mechanisms include, uh, we have uh, distributed data parallel, DDP, which is offered by Py PyTorch natively. Horobot, uh, which is a library ba based on the uh, ring all reduce algorithm. Uh, this deep speed, which is a distributed training library capable of training model with more than, than 100 million parameters. And, and finally, uh, first scale, which is a, which is a DDP based library that include uh, new optimizations uh, for distributed training. Uh, in all the experiments, we use uh, the Summit supercomputer. Uh, Summit is made up of more than 4,000 nodes. And each node has two IBM Power9 CPUs and six NVIDIA Tesla B100 GPUs. Uh, all the experiments, uh, all, all the experimentation was carried out with PyTorch using distributed training mechanisms like DDP, Horrible, deep, deep Speed, and First Scale. In addition, we use the CNN ResNet 50, ResNet 101, uh, BGG16, and BGG19. Also, uh, most of the exper experiment performance were based on scaling in GPUs using up to 40 summit uh, nodes, uh, which is uh, an equivalent to 240 GPUs. Uh, Furthermore, depending on the experiment, different distributed training mechanisms and CNN are used. It is important to mention that the tra trainings were executed uh, up to 200 epochs yeah. and each value that was reported is an average value of the execution of 10 replication trainings. About the scalability, uh, the experimental results, uh, the first experiment developed uh, consisted in studying of scalability of the different distributed training mechanisms. We measure the time of the distributed training with different number of GPUs. Uh, in figure two, we can see how the performance increases. That is the training time is reduced in the same way that the number of GPUs increases. However, when reaching 140 GPUs, uh, the, the average time per, per training is similar among all four distributed training mechanisms. Um, the worst performance is presented by Horowitz with six GPUs, that is one node. Uh, and the, on the other hand, the, the difference in per So I think something happened with the panelists. So we are going to wait for one minute and then 
if anyone want to ask something, please write on the chat. Okay, we have <laughs> something issues, but next we are going to start with California Polytechnic State University with a distributed artificial intelligence model training and evaluation presented by Maria Pantoja, Cristina Morahan, Alexander Garcia, and Ivan Shang. Finally, Dimitri Timothy King. So go ahead. Right? <laughs> See? Okay. So, yes, my, my name is uh, Maria Pandoja. I'm in California Polytechnic. Um, and this is actually my first time uh, having the honor of presenting at Carla. And, um, and I hope uh, next year will be also in person so I can also go. But I'm presenting the work from my students uh, in distributed artificial intelligence uh, training and evaluation. Um, let me advance if I can. No, I can't. Oh, no. Um, so this is what we are going to talk about. Um, uh, the index uh, implementation results and then at the end I have the links to the code so because the code is it can be expanded and we want actually if people want to keep expanding this work to to actually go ahead and do it um, okay so this is the problem that we are trying to solve and training in machine learning I mean, it actually is very computationally intensive. Of course, it depends on the network, right? We already know that. But um, uh, also, when we when we are starting selecting the model, there is actually a lot of uh, hyperparameters, like uh, as simple as knowing what is the activation function, the number of nodes, the number of uh, layers, and so on. Those are all hyperparameters. So when we don't know at the beginning, we usually just test uh, many of them and see which one is the best. We have an idea of uh, which one is the best, but then we fine tuning and those hyperparameters is, is adding to the, to the time, the computational intensity of, uh, of the training. So what we wanted to do in this project is to make this hyperparameter tuning uh, automatic uh, and, and faster, uh, make it that also so it can work on a distributed system. Um, because the project that we were working on was, um, was actually um, uh, working with my marine biologists, so they have tons of videos. So another problem that we have is that the, it's not only that the training was very intensive, is that the inference, then once the model is already trained, releasing the model in, um, uh, in the wild in the, for the users to use uh, was actually also very slow because we will need it to process a very complex uh, network um, parameters on, on video and they needed the response to be fast. So we also accelerated that part. So it's, uh, we, so we are doing two things, hyperparameter tuning and inference in video, the speed up of inference in video. And there are common parts to the project. So, um, so talking a little bit more about this hyperparameter tuning and what we mean by that. So what we want is to develop an infrastructure that the user is uh, able to either it gets already a configuration file with all the hyperparameters that he or she doesn't know um, how to, they, they need to be optimized. Or is either a file or we actually provide a user interface so it can select a, a couple of, uh, of uh, parameters by default. And then once this uh, file is selected, then we are actually going to run on a distributed system, um, the different trainings on different, uh, on different computers on the cluster. Uh, and then produce the output, of course. Like I said, the hyperparameters are all, all over the place. It's not only, so it can be super complex, like, even the model, do we want a recurrent neuronal network with LSTM? 
um, um, grew layers and so on. Something more simple, do we want actually a convolutional layer of what type, what is the size of the convolution? But even, in, in, even if we have very clear what we want to do in the model and the layers, still the learning, learning rate, which are our function to use and so on, um, sometimes is, is basically is uh, based on whatever we know, previous knowledge, but we don't know for sure if it's going to work and we, we want to, to optimize it. Um, the implementation, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation, which is the interesting part, training and running different training with different parameter on, the, on, on a distributed system is actually relatively simple to do. Uh, what is actually difficult is to, to actually do it efficiently in any kind of cluster. And in my university, uh, we started this project in the, at the beginning of the pandemic in the, um, March 20. And we had no access to the lab in person, definitely. And, uh, but neither the people actually supporting the lab. So the machines were coming in, coming out. And the, sometimes we didn't have any of them working. Sometimes we had one. So we ended up with this uh, idea of um, the system has to be super robust. So it should be able to work on a high performance computing. If we have it, it should be able to work in the lab or even in two machines in at home that we connect together, it should be able to distribute on that machine. So the most interesting part of, the, of this project was that uh, we made it uh, um, like a distributed system. So, uh, we need a programming language for a distributed system, and we choose Go programming language because it's actually easy to learn. It, it, has a, it doesn't have a steeper learning curve. Um, it's actually very well supported. It has already tons of library, and it's becoming a little bit standard in server-side programming. And, um, and we did already work on a library to, so we enter uh, um, IP addresses of computers and then um, directly we are able to distribute uh, tasks on, on the system. So based on that previous work, Go was our best uh, uh, choice for the programming language. And then with Go, we, we wanted to implement consensus and replica. We wanted to be the system, the system to be robust. So we actually built um, two main components, the user interface. Also, we needed a user interface. And um, yeah, C and, uh, and this MPI and things like that is basically impossible to write it. Uh, Go allows us to write a user interface and the server size, right? Um, so that's... That's why we choose Go. We do have a user interface, and then we have uh, the server side with a fault tolerant uh, consensus and replica algorithm. We implemented a little bit of the details of the of um, the consensus algorithm. We are based on gossip. Um, uh, and um, so it's a, it's, it's a simplification with it's a full um, Paxos implementation. It's a little bit of an overkill. Um, so our Paxos implementation is a gossip to the next two nodes, the neighbor two nodes, and those two nodes talk to the two neighbors and so on. And they exchange, so, so it doesn't have so much message, uh, message passing. It's just communicating to the two neighbors. Um, so we want to detect also if they, if they go down, and if they go down, the, the masters will be able to uh, send the work to uh, another one, whichever one is available. Uh, a little bit more about the, in this implementation is that it's based on Paxos. The consensus is based on Paxos. We do need a master node because that is the one that reads the configuration file and is going to be sending the, uh, the work to all the other nodes in the system. It's also the one that keep uh, basically track of who is on or off um, and is going to be able to redistribute the system. 
um, because we relay, rely heavily on this master, then that means if the master goes down, we really don't want the system to go down, the computation to go down. So we do have um, a replica for the master. We have two saddle masters also uh, running. And if the if the neighbors uh, don't receive any any heartbeat from the or any work from the master in a certain amount of time, then the election start and they um, they select which one is the, the next master to to run and the system doesn't go down it keeps running. Um, recovery is uh, is recovery is a little bit simplified again and it's because. Um, our system is uh, in the lab, is, it has a very simple uh, structure. So the, the recovery is through the Sado master. They keep a, a log that is replicated by two. Um, and if something happens, then uh, we will be able to go to the log and within two seconds, more or less, um, we should be able to recover the work and continue. So it's actually pretty reliable uh, and it's coming from the pain that we had uh, with our labs that uh, at the beginning we have tons of problems and, and, um, and the recovery and being able to go to, to the lab and, 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 and put, take them on, on and off again was actually very difficult. Um, at some point we actually, sorry, I, I shouldn't have had one. So I, well, I, I'll talk about this later, but at some point we actually got to run the system also on, the, on a real HPC. I will talk about that on the, on the results. Um, oh, I went back. I'm also at the same time, I, I'm, I'm admitting people, so it's, I, it's a little bit distracting, right? Uh, this is, that was the implementation of the hyperparameters tuning. Um, the basic implementation is we need an interface, a master that distribute the work uh, uh, among the servers, um, and it has to be very reliable. Uh, this is actually the, the inference implementation now that the system is already trained. Now we really need to do uh, speed up the, the inference in, even if we only have one computer with multiple cores, we should be able to implement it, right? Uh, speed it up with whatever hardware we have. And, uh, and because this video, video is, is actually, is very intensive, it's 60, 30 to 60 frames per second. And we actually, it was object detection, so it needs to track um, an object through the entire video. And it does not only track the object, it actually does the speed of the movement and what kind of object it is and several other measurements that the researchers wanted. Uh, over the, so it's not just tracking, but it's just recognizing, tracking, doing a, a lot of calculation and then dumping all of that into um, Excel spreadsheet that then they are able to analyze. So again, we are reducing the same distributed system in a structure. We do have, uh, we have the, um, the user is going to call our script and give us the video and the model that they want to run on the video and the training has already been done. So what the, the master node is going to do is get the video, chunk it, and send the different chunks into the nodes um, and run. And then the nodes are going to run um, the scripts on the nodes. It's also using the consensus and replica algorithm. So something goes down, goes back to the master and the master restarts some other worker. Um, each one of the, of the nodes, it runs the script. We are actually uh, running OpenCV for, um, for, so the model does image uh, uh, recognition it recognizes a specific uh, animal creature, a, a fish. I don't know which kind of fish, but it recognizes a fish. And then it starts tracking it with OpenCV. Um, because the, the video was chunk, um, then we also, the, there is some overlapping. So just so if the object appears on one chunk and then it continues on the next chunk, so it doesn't get lost. There is always an, an overlap. 
uh, when we when we just divide the video, we just don't divide. We actually send uh, at the end of this video. We found this uh, this creature. So just will start checking uh, to the to the next chunk of the video. So there is a little. So this algorithm is a little bit more complex uh, than than is just dividing the chunk and just start tracking. Um, these are actually the results. The result of the hyperparameter tuning are a little bit like, okay, so uh, it depends on uh, the speed up is going to be completely dependent on how many nodes we, we have on the system available to run. This is actually how the interface look like. If, if you don't, you can load the configuration file, but if you don't have that configuration file, then you can actually, we have, like I said, by default, several parameters. So like how many layers do you want? And by default, it will create, so if you say three, it will create uh, uh, three, two, one, and four, five, six, seven. And, and run the model and give you the results, the accuracy for the model with the different uh, parameters. And then you can select which one you want. And you can run it again as, ma as many times as you want, basically. Um, we actually run this uh, system on our lab. And at some point we have the exceed, uh, through the exceed program, we have an allocation on the, Pittsburgh supercomputer, so we were actually able to run it on the Pittsburgh supercomputer also. So like I said, it's very scalable. We will run at home or at a supercomputer. That's, that's our life. It's like sometimes we, we don't have machines, sometimes we actually somebody, we can borrow that. Um, this is actually the inference. The inference was actually only measured on our lab machines, which uh, right now they, we have a super nice machine, but uh, last year this was an Intel e, Xeon E9. Um, so it's actually kind of an old CPU and the GPU was a 790, so also very old. Uh, still, you can see how well it scaled, uh, right? With one, two to 30 nodes, it was 15 min minutes to run the inference. We got it to run in one, in one minute. Um, um, so th this is the summary of the, the project. As a conclusion, we actually, uh, the main contributions of this project is actually uh, twofold, we um, implemented a uh, um, hyper uh, parameter tuning on a distributed system that is reliable and scalable. And we also accelerated the inference um, of, uh, of, um, of the model. Uh, for future, future work, uh, all of this was done using Go and relying on TensorFlow, um, TensorFlow and Keras. Um, so for future implementation, we definitely want to improve the, uh, the input and um, the user interface so they can actually put more parameters uh, that they, they want to tune. Um, and we want a better, to integrate it a little bit better with TensorFlow. Um, um, because right now it's, uh, it's a little bit of a pain. So we can do better on the scene and, and we are working already on that. Um, like I said uh, the, at the beginning, we actually have a GitHub with all the, the code. We want people to use it and, and, we, were, and we are an undergraduate research, uh, research institution. We have master, master and undergraduate doing the research. So we need the code to, so somebody work on research for one year and we need that code to stay there. And so the next uh, generation comes, doesn't have to start from the beginning. And then if any other university wants to also work on a collaboration by themselves, we want the code to be replicable. Um, so, and, 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 and you can use it if you want. And here are the links. Um, so this is the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Maria, for your nice presentation. Could you please write the GitHub repository on the chat for all, all the audience? Could you please write 
the GitHub repository direction on the chat? Okay, yeah, of course. I'm going to restart with Alvin because something happened the last time, but now we can continue. <laughs> Go ahead, Alvis. Okay, okay. First, excuse me for the interruption. I had uh, some uh, internet, internet connection problems. I, I am going to restart from the experimental results. Okay, uh, I am going to talk about the, the scalability, scalability study. Uh, this was the, the first experiment developed. Uh, this experiment consisted of studying the scalability of the different distributed training mechanisms. Uh, we measure the time of the distributed training with different number of GPUs. In the figure two, uh, we can see how the performance increases. Uh, that is the training time is reduced uh, in the same way uh, that the number of GPUs increases. However, when reaching 140 GPUs, the average time per training is similar, similar among uh, all the four distributed uh, training mechanisms. Uh, on the other hand, the difference in performance between DDP and first scale is, is minimal. By but they differ in the throughput generated by by each framework as as you can see in the in the figure two to be. Uh, the table three shows the performance training data of the four distributed um, training mechanisms mechanisms with the with the four CNNs. Uh, we can see that in all the cases there is a notable reduction in the execution time. Furthermore, the results show us that deep speed uh, has the best performance with all CNNs. Uh, however, the training time don't present a significant difference that allow us to, to establish that uh, distributed training mechanisms is really superior in performance. Uh, about the accuracy and the scaling trade-off. Uh, this experiment was carried out to analyze aspects uh, related to accuracy and error reduction with the uh, distributed training mechanisms. In figure three, there is a representation of the accuracy of DDP training, taking into account the same CN CNN, but with different number of layers. Um, uh, we can see that the accuracy behaves similarly with both with both CNNs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in both figures, the, the effect of accuracy produced by the increase in the number of GPUs is remarkable. There is a, a clear reduction in accuracy at the number of GPU scales. scales. Uh, to try to reduce uh, this unwanted effect, optimizations uh, and autocast auto tuning techniques uh, that are beyond the scope of this study must be applied. Uh, additionally, in both figures, the accuracy is more stable with a few GPUs and becomes irregular when scaling. Uh, table four shows the results of all the experiments related to the behavior of, of the accuracy. Some key elements that we can highlight from this table are, are for example, um, with Horwood uh, using two types of rendered, uh, the, the accuracy suffered less degradation when scaling on GPUs. Also, the CNN with more layers can generate slightly uh, lower accuracy compared with the with the version with few, fewer layers. And, and also there, there are no significant difference between the RedNet and BGG networks. Uh, uh, about the mixed precision in distributed training, uh, this is one of the two optimization techniques that we use in mixed precision uh, through the NVIDIA Apex library. Uh, from this library, we use our automatic mixed precision utility. Uh, 
the mixed precision training considers an auto casting mechanism and chooses the, the precision for GPU operations to improve the, the performance while maintaining the, the accuracy. In these experiments, we use two modes of automatic mixed precision, the O1 and the O2. Uh, the other, there are four modes, uh, but the other modes are not considered true mixed precision. And that modes are, are useful for establishing uh, accuracy and speed-based cases. Uh, in table five, uh, we, can, we can see the, the time performance results. And it is notable that with both uh, CNNs, the, the O2 mode uh, has slightly uh, better performance, uh, reducing the training time compared with the base time. Also in figures four and five, uh, we can see that there is an improvement in, in accuracy and loss uh, with, the, with the both modes uh, with respect to the accuracy without optimization. Uh, this same experiment was performed with Rennet 50, however, neither mode had a, a significant effect. We were able to verify that, that modifying the precision of the, of the floating points uh, floating point values uh, can improve the performance and accuracy. However, not all the cases will show an improvement. Only by experimenting with those optimization can it be determined whether is a, there is a, a real improvement. Uh, the last experiment was done with, with a technique called adaptive summation or at a zoom uh, using Horwood. The, the experiment consisted of running training with and uh, without a zoom and increasing the batch size. Uh, the figure six shows ac the accurate results. Uh, the figure groups the, the results that we wanted to compare by color. And um, it is notable that in all the cases, uh, at a zoom. Uh, improve the results when comparing training with and without, without this technique. Also, a particular behavior can be observed with the batch sizes of, of 96 and 128. In these cases, in these cases, Arasum generated lower accuracy values in early epochs, but um, uh, after that, the accuracy improved. Uh, near the, the, the epoch 150. Finally, the table six summarizes the results of the experiments. An important element to, to note is that there is not, there is a notable increase in the execution time when we use uh, add a zoom. Uh, therefore, the use of this technique, this, this technique uh, will depend uh, on the need of the, of the user and the available hardware. The conclusions uh, of this uh, study, uh, we can conclude that there are several issues, trade-offs that remain to be, to be resolved in distributed training. Um, and this paper we, in this paper, we explore some of this, despite uh, the most popular mechanism having good scalability in the execution time with their base configuration, there is a significant, significant, significant accuracy degradation as more nodes are used. Also, in the future world, we intend other techniques, techniques applied in distributed training, such, such as uh, model, uh, model and pipeline parallelism. Uh, also, additionally, it's necessary to study, study and experiment with, with main optimization approaches for scaling in, in GPUs. Thank you for your time. Okay, great job. Well, uh, you have one question until now. Did you explore to use another link and to sim some process to the P9 processor? If anyone wants questions, please write on the chat. Uh, excuse me, what is the question? If you 
explore to use enable link. Ah, okay. No, no, we, we only explore the, the use of different distributed training mechanisms. We, we wanted to compare how is the performance of, of that mechanisms. We want to also, we want to analyze, uh, for example, if Horror would use uh, APEC, a, a, a Zoom, how is the performance compared with a Zoom, or for example, uh, how, how, how are the, 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 the trainings, the training performance with, with needs precision, but we, we, don't, we don't use as the, um, yeah. <laughs> That, that, okay. that technique. Okay, great, great. Well, so finally, our fourth work is an, an analysis of neural, neural architecture search and hype, I don't know, sorry. No, yes. Search and hyperparameter optimization methods presented by David Puentes, Carlos Barrios, Philippe Nabux from University Industrial de Santander. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I am David Puentes, and I'm, I will present the work An Analysis of Neural Architecture Search and Hyperparameter Optimization Methods. This work was in collaboration with uh, Carlos Barrios and Philip Navarro. This presentation I will do in Spanish. I will be more comfortable doing it. El orden de la presentación inicia con eh, la descripción del problema de búsqueda de arquitecturas y optimización de hiperparámetros. Posteriormente se hablará de los métodos de optimización, un análisis de ocurrencia y finalmente lo que corresponde a las conclusiones y futuros trabajos. Bien. Eh, el aprendizaje profundo ha demostrado resultados bastante favorables en diferentes aplicaciones como lo es la visión por computadora, la clasificación de imágenes, el procesamiento del lenguaje natural, entre otros. Sin embargo, como ya se ha mencionado, eh, la dependencia del desempeño de estas soluciones está estrechamente ligado a la calidad de los datos, pero también a los hiperparámetros que se definan y a la arquitectura de la red neuronal. Tareas que generalmente suelen ser realizadas por personas expertas, lo que restringe o limita el potencial de estas soluciones al incluir la subjetividad humana. Formalmente, eh, el problema de optimización de hiperparámetros busca identificar un conjunto de hiperparámetros en un espacio de búsqueda de tal manera que se minimice el error de un algoritmo de aprendizaje. Respecto a la búsqueda de arquitecturas, se pretende explorar dos espacios de búsqueda. Uno es un primer espacio relacionado con eh, la arquitectura global de la red neuronal y un segundo espacio para los diferentes elementos asociados a cada una de las capas. Ahora bien, se han establecido diferentes soluciones o se han buscado maneras para reducir esta intervención humana, como lo están siendo la búsqueda por cuadrícula o, los métodos, o la búsqueda aleatoria. La búsqueda por cuadrícula sugiere la configuración de todas las posibles combinaciones de los valores de los hiperparámetros, mientras que la búsqueda aleatoria plantea que se consideren hiperparámetros aleatorios. Sin embargo, pues estas dos soluciones resultan ser eh, no muy efectivas o no, eh, no son fácilmente escalables debido a que son exhaustivas y no están haciendo la búsqueda de manera orientada. Ahora, para hacer frente a este problema, se han adoptado diferentes técnicas de optimización, como lo son los métodos metabolísticos, que si bien no garantizan alcanzar un óptimo global, sino se nos permiten llegar a una respuesta eh, considerable en un tiempo y en un recurso computacional un poco más eh, factible. Dentro de estos métodos de optimización se destaca la optimización bayesiana, los algoritmos basados en poblaciones, como lo es la inteligencia de partículas y los algoritmos evolutivos y el aprendizaje reportado. A continuación, vamos a describir de manera general las ventajas y desventajas de cada uno de ellos. Bien. La optimización bayesiana, como su nombre lo sugiere, parte de, la, de las probabilidades bayesianas donde se busca adaptar una función 
eh, a una función de caja negra, siendo esta una de sus principales ventajas, que ha mostrado éxito para modelar funciones de caja negra. Toman en consideración la probabilidad de los eventos para la elección de los siguientes candidatos a considerar como posible óptimo para el respectivo problema y finalmente eh, no dependen de, un, de la definición de unos hiperparámetros previo a su aplicación. Como desventajas se tienen que son difícilmente escalables o aplicables a espacios de búsqueda altamente dimensionales. Eh, su espacio de búsqueda, eh, viendo la optimización bayesiana desde su punto básico, eh, no puede considerar hiperparámetros de tipo categórico, lo que limita o restringe bastante pues, el desempeño de estos. Y finalmente, también desde la perspectiva básica, son difícilmente paralelizables debido a que depende una solución, depende de soluciones previas. Es decir, pues eh, la condicionalidad limita esta paralelización. Los algoritmos basados en poblaciones, por otro lado, toman elementos de del comportamiento natural de, las, de los individuos y buscan mejorar de manera colectiva el desempeño de una serie de soluciones. Uno de estos, pues, digamos, de los más populares están siendo los algoritmos evolutivos, destacando lo que están siendo los algoritmos genéticos. Entonces, como principal ventaja tiene que permiten hacer una exploración y explotación del espacio de búsqueda apoyándose en los respectivos operadores. Eh, han demostrado también poder eh, ser eh, adecuados para abordar problemas altamente dimensionales y finalmente pues requieren, eh, son relativamente sencillos de entender, por lo que son fácilmente aplicables. Sin embargo, pues rescatando la exploración y explotación también resulta ser uno de sus grandes, una de sus grandes desventajas, ya que se necesita evaluar todos los individuos que hacen parte de la solución de la, de la población. Entonces resulta ser altamente costoso su implementación. También hay una alta dependencia de los hiperparámetros que se definan para el algoritmo eh, evolutivo o de poblaciones que también pues, restringen eh, el desempeño y se alcanzan soluciones diferentes dependiendo de los operadores que se hayan elegido en el comienzo y finalmente son difícilmente interpretables ya que no se evalúan cómo cada solución interactúa con el ambiente a lo largo de las generaciones. Luego se tiene el aprendizaje reforzado que también toma elementos propios de la naturaleza esta vez de la manera en que los individuos aprenden, reforzando el comportamiento o aquellos estímulos positivos y dejando de lado o olvidando aquellos que representaron algún estímulo negativo. Y precisamente acá está una de sus principales desventajas, ya que en la, en la exploración va a evitar contemplar soluciones que de alguna forma representaron un estímulo negativo. Eh, enfocándose solamente pues, en esas positivas o pues, en esa explotación. Existe la posibilidad de que los agentes interactúen de manera restringida o limitada con el ambiente y finalmente, al igual que las cadenas de Markov, eh, acá no se va a percibir un óptimo, sino mejorar una solución. Entonces no se, no se está percibiendo eh, un óptimo global para, para nuestra función, sino busca que la recompensa cada vez sea mejor. Respecto a sus ventajas, tiene que abordar el problema como una totalidad, ya que el ambiente va a, inter va a buscar interactuar con, con el ambiente. Hay una independencia del punto de partida. Y finalmente, se tienen en cuenta eh, consecuencias de decisiones previas, eh, permitiéndonos eh, considerar una temporalidad. Sumado a esto, también se encuentra que han habido trabajos que buscan incluir lo que es la optimización multiobjetiva. Cuando se trabaja con estos modelos de aprendizaje profundo, por lo general se suele hacer énfasis en mejorar, un análisis, en mejorar una métrica de desempeño, ya sea una presión, una entropía o una validación. Sin embargo, también se identifica que existen otros objetivos igualmente importantes, como lo son el tamaño de la red, ya sea el número de, de, de parámetros, número de neuronas o el costo computacional que implica 
el entrenamiento o la búsqueda de estas arquitecturas, como lo puede ser el uso de memoria o la cantidad de operaciones que se realizan. Para estudiar en profundidad eh, más este problema, se realizó una, eh, un análisis de ocurrencias de términos claves utilizando la siguiente eh, ecuación de búsqueda eh, implementada en la base de datos que es pocos. Inicialmente se obtuvieron 1.280 resultados que fueron limitados a artículos y a una ventana de tiempo del 2015 al 2020, resaltando que esta, este trabajo o esta búsqueda se hizo en marzo, entre marzo y abril del presente año. Después de aplicar estos criterios de inclusión y exclusión, se encontraron 351 resultados, los cuales fueron análisis, se realizó un análisis de ocurrencia sobre los metadatos, es decir, títulos, eh, palabras claves, abstract, y fue utilizada la herramienta Voz Viver, donde se hizo pues, una, la construcción de un, término, de un testauro para unificar los términos empleados en la literatura. Después de este análisis se encontró que se identifican cinco grandes clústeres. El primero de ellos, de ellos asociado con las aplicaciones, donde se resalta que principalmente las aplicaciones en la solución de estos dos problemas están siendo para la clasificación de imágenes, el mejoramiento de imágenes o el procesamiento de imágenes, dejando de lado o en menor medida eh, aplicaciones igualmente interesantes como lo es el análisis temático, el procesamiento de señales y el reconocimiento de patrones. Un segundo clúster eh, está relacionado con todo lo que corresponde a la fase de aprendizaje de los modelos de aprendizaje profundo. Y se habla de, pues, de esto dado que se identifican eh, términos como lo está haciendo el método de gradientes, eh, grad métodos estocásticos, aprendizaje, eh, modelos de aprendizaje y tasas de aprendizaje. ¿Me escuchan bien? Sí. ¿Sí? Oh. Bien. En, en la siguiente figura se muestra un mapa de calor donde se resaltan los principales términos destacados para este segundo clúster. Nuevamente resaltando, pues, que se busca eh, mejorar el aprendizaje de las redes neuronales o eh, reducir las posibilidades de sobreaprendizaje. Un tercer clúster, que fue el más pequeño identificado, está asociado con aplicaciones multiobjetivas, donde principalmente suelen tomar eh, como objetivos complementarios la complejidad de las redes neuronales y el costo computacional. Eh, en esta gráfica se muestra cómo ha sido la, temporalmente cómo ha sido el interés por esta optimización multiobjetiva, destacando que su interés está siendo bastante reciente, eh, apareciendo en lo que está haciendo para, eh, la última, para el último año de 2019 a 2020. Eh, respecto a lo que son los clústeres 4 y 5, se hablan de los métodos de optimización, siendo eh, los más populares los algoritmos genéticos y la optimización valenciana. Y principalmente estos métodos de optimización han sido utilizados para abordar el problema de optimización de hiperparámetros. Se destaca que acá se hace una diferenciación entre los algoritmos evolutivos, los algoritmos genéticos y los enjambres de partículas, siendo todos ellos parte de los algoritmos basados en población. Y en menor medida se encuentra que ha habido un interés o aplicación del aprendizaje reforzado. Sin embargo, pues también ha, ha mostrado eh, resultados bastante favorables. Entonces, como conclusiones, nosotros encontramos que se reafirma la necesidad de encontrar herramientas o estrategias que disminuyan o eh, eliminen la dependencia humana en la construcción de las redes neuronales y en el ajuste o definición de sus hiperparámetros. Luego, hay una eh, amplia variedad de estrategias para poder optimizar eh, estos dos problemas o darle solución sin embargo, se destacan eh, como los más populares los algoritmos basados en poblaciones, específicamente los algoritmos evolutivos y con un entusiasmo creciente por la optimización bayesiana y el aprendizaje reforzado.
De los trabajos consultados se identifica eh, que, se, que se dan dos grandes focos. El primero de ellos asociado a la comparación o al benchmark entre diferentes eh, alternativas de solución, utilizando conjuntos de datos altamente populares como lo están haciendo UPAD o MINS. Y un segundo foco está orientado hacia las aplicaciones médicas, ya sea para la identificación de, de enfermedades, para tomografías, de lectura de electrocardiogramas, para estas aplicaciones médicas. Lo que nos lleva a una cuarta conclusión, y es que la, eh, el interés se está centrando totalmente en la clasificación de imágenes, dejando de lado pues, aplicaciones que también son muy importantes de este aprendizaje profundo, como lo está haciendo el procesamiento del lenguaje natural, la detección de objetos y el análisis de audio. Por último, eh, se identifica que hay un, eh, un bajo número de trabajos relacionados con la optimización multiobjetivo. Lo que destacando que, por lo general, más del 90% de estos trabajos están orientados a la mejora de una métrica de clasificación. Finalmente, en cuanto a futuros trabajos, se destaca que hay una carencia de un protocolo experimental o de una línea base que permita comparar diferentes trabajos, ya que las soluciones que se alcanzan bien pueden estar utilizando diferentes arquitecturas pues, computacionales, diferentes estrategias de normalización que pues, hacen difícil la comparación entre soluciones. Es importante identificar cuándo y dónde se da la ganancia de la búsqueda y de los algoritmos de aprendizaje, ya que esto nos va a permitir orientar de mejor, de mejor manera la búsqueda en el espacio de, de búsqueda, o valga su redundancia. Es también interesante poder intentar abordar el problema de construcción de arquitecturas y optimización de interparámetros de manera conjunta y no como problemas independientes, la inclusión de múltiples objetivos y finalmente la construcción de espacios de búsqueda adaptativo, de tal manera que permitan ir descartando a la medida que se hace la exploración hiperparámetros poco prometedores y también evitar el aprendizaje de eh, soluciones que a la larga pues, no van a ser eh, favorables para la optimización de estos dos problemas. Por tu atención, muchísimas gracias. Ok. Thank you very much for your valuable time. If anyone wants to ask something to Esteban, please let a note on the chat. We are almost finished our track of high performance computing and artificial intelligence. So thank you very much to all the attendants. It was a pleasure to stay with us. So I don't know if anyone wants to ask something, David. Excuse me. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyone wants to ask something? We have time. A couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Some of the audience asked if the material will be shared for all the panelists. Uh, okay, and David, do you know why the Bayesian network are going down in use? Well, uh, Eh, el problema que hay con la, con la optimización bayesiana o digamos la, son difícilmente eh, escalables por la, digamos, la, la necesidad que hay eh, o el costo computacional que implica realizar la respectiva búsqueda. Entonces, digamos, en la construcción, en el número, los métodos bayesianos requieren que se defina una, un modelo sustituto y una función de adquisición. 
Entonces, en la construcción del modelo sustituto, eh, se sigue un proceso, un proceso gaussiano que depende o necesita de la matriz de covarianza, y esa matriz de covarianza pues, es difícilmente computable cuando incrementa el número de, de dimensiones. Entonces, pues, digamos, la escalabilidad de estos algoritmos pues, es muy, muy restringida. Entonces, pues, por eso es que han venido intentando mudar a otro tipo de soluciones. Ok, another question. Do you plan to explore the use of fine tuning such transformers? Eh, bueno, por ahora nosotros estamos evaluando la posibilidad de encontrar estrategias de optimización para eh, inicialmente para redes convolucionales y para eh, redes recurrentes. Sin embargo, pues esta parte de los transformers no la hemos contemplado, aunque pues sí sabemos de la popularidad que han venido ganando, por lo que también sería interesante hacer el respectivo ajuste de estas alternativas. Ok, uh, for the only audience, uh, the presentations will be shared. Ok, so thank you very much for your valuable time. It was a pleasure.